You started your career in the Middle East, and you have been covering the Middle East for 35 years. In fact, you wrote a very famous book titled From Beirut to Jerusalem. So how has the Middle East changed? Well, says I would put the difference this way. 60 years ago, I'm just making this up, Asian leaders came to their people and said, my people, here's the deal. We're going to give you the, we're going to take away your freedom. But we're going to give you the best education, infrastructure, and export-led economics that money can buy. We're going to take away your freedom, but we're going to give you that. In 60 years, you'll build a middle class big enough to take your freedom back. In the Middle East, Arab leaders came to their people 60 years ago and said, my people, we're going to take away your freedom, and we're going to give you the Arab-Israeli conflict. We're going to give you a shiny object over here to distract you. So 60 years ago, in the Middle East, South Korea and Egypt had the same per capita income. And from that difference, that Asian leaders were dictators but modernizers, and Arab leaders were dictators but predators, came a situation today where South Korea has something like four times the GDP of the whole Arab world combined. So what's the difference between the Middle East then and the Middle East today? What says? Decades of more population, wasted resources, and wasted time. To the point you have today, states that are literally collapsing or being collapsed and can no longer deliver human development to their people. The Middle East today is a human development disaster area. And it's an area of disorder. You have been writing that the new world is uh, uh, the clash between the world of order and the world of disorder. Explain that. Well, if you said, Tom, what, what are the biggest forces shaping the world today? I would argue four things. One is that Moore's law, that the speed and power of microchips will keep doubling every two years, has now kept doubling, 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 and created a huge information technology powerhouse. That's been combined with the fact that globalization has brought the world together so it's no longer interconnected, it's interdependent. That's combined with the fact that climate change and uh, biodiversity loss, environmental degradation have also grown exponentially. And that's been combined with a very toxic combination of debt, deficits, demographics, and growth. We've never had bigger debts with more people retiring at a time of demographic collapse in the industrial world. So there's so more many people who will have to be supported by so many fewer people with so much big debt. Now those four forces, Boy says, are stressing out strong countries. And I think what they're doing is they're starting to blow up weak countries. From your perspective of countries that are uh, countries of order and control and countries of anarchy and disorder, Saddam Hussein was an anchor of order. Uh, Saddam Hussein, you may despise his tyranny and his criminality, and he was a tyrant, but he provided order. So knowing what you know now, do you think the world would be a better place if Saddam was still in power? Um, he was a provider of order, and he was an enormous provider of disorder at the same time, because this is a man who was murdering vast numbers of his own population, not to mention Kurds with poison gas. And so um, we, it turns out, decapitated Iraq. Uh, but we didn't decapitate Syria. The Syrian people did that. So I would argue today, had we not decapitated Iraq, I am sure that Iraq today would look exactly like Syria today in terms of the people themselves rising up against the regime. But at least it would have been their problem it would not have been our problem. We would have not have started the process. But I think that all of these forms of order that relied on oil, arms, repression, are simply getting more and more difficult to sustain now that we live in an age of the end of power. And what about Muammar Gaddafi? Again, with Saddam and with Gaddafi, he says, you have to understand what I believe what, what the mistake was. The mistake was not removing them. The mistake was removing them and not putting in place any structure of order to replace them. That was the great mistake. Another imminent possible potential transformation in the Middle East is the deal between the United States and the allies, yes. uh, the six powers, right. uh, with Iran. I, uh, 
you have written that uh, for the Iranians, this is a, just a transactional deal. This is just another transaction. While the United States and the, its allies look at it as a transformational uh, deal. Explain that. Well, you know, the Iranian leadership wants this just to be a transaction. We'll give you a little time on our nuclear weapon, and you'll give us the resources so we can stay in power far beyond that and have a bomb. Okay? We are hoping that once we sign this deal and open Iran up to the world, that enough fresh air will come in that the Iranian people will want more of it and therefore no longer be willing to tolerate the iron-fisted leadership of the Ayatollahs. That's, their, that's our bet, that's their bet. In the middle of all that, there is an imminent decision to be made. So do you, th do you support that? I have not made up my mind, Moises, uh, because I want to see the details. Details here really matter. The detail like what happens if we detect, we believe we detect, that Iran has some illicit nuclear program going on in an army base not covered by this agreement. We say we want to see that. They say no. It actually goes to an arbitration council. Who's on that arbitration council? Is it the Security Council, Russia and China? What does that mean? The details here really matter to me, number one. Number two, I have to confess, I'm bothered by any negotiation of this type where at no point in the negotiations did we get up and walk out. It really bothers me. There was no point where, when we said to the Iranians, you have to ship all your enriched uranium out of the country. And they said, no, no, our pride. There was no point we said, forget your pride. We have pride. Enjoy your sanctions. Have a nice life. There is, as you know, a lot of criticism of President Obama. Uh, there, are, there is a segment of the country, indeed a segment of the world, that doesn't like uh, President Obama. And a lot of it has to do with uh, his personality. People think that he's aloof, that he's detached, that he doesn't do politics, and that doesn't do what politicians have to do in order to build coalitions and support, and uh, that he's hard to read. On the other hand, there's another view that says that whoever sits in the Oval Office these days will have more constraints. And the expectations of uh, people uh, are so high that it's impossible to satisfy them. So which of the two sides uh, do you think uh, you share? Uh, both. I think they're both true. I think that um, Obama uh, is aloof. He has not engaged in a lot of the traditional glad-handing and backslapping of politics. But you know, my sister, there was a story the other day in the Washington Post about one of the columnists, Dana Milbank. It's a very interesting story about Ted Cruz. Dana Milbank pointed out that Ted Cruz, when he was a senator, on the question of should we bomb Syria, Ted Cruz came out and said, Obama must not bomb Syria. This is not our fight. We shouldn't be involved in this. Ted Cruz is now running for president. A few weeks ago on the campaign trail, he came out and said, Obama is the worst president in the world because he wouldn't bomb Syria. The same guy who two years ago or three years ago supported Obama now is accusing him. So what does Obama see? What is that? If you're looking at that from Obama, the rank and rancid cynicism of the people he's dealing with doesn't exactly make you think, geez, if I only invite Ted Cruz over for hot dogs and beer, we'll be able to work all this out as two reasonable guys. What's just missing is a few hot dogs. So on the one hand, I, I, I sympathize with the president on that. I think our politics is more dysfunctional and polarized than ever. At the same time, at the margin, you never know. You, you, you never know um, what more engagement could do. At the same time, though, I believe this is a very hard world to manage. This is a terrible time to be running anything. How do you explain the fact that President Obama, then candidate Obama, was extolled by everyone as a great communicator that managed the internet and the new tools of communications like no one else, that brought a lot of innovation to political campaigning, and that was really uh, very effective of changing minds and persuading people and energizing supporters. Then he moved to the White House, and somehow all of that faded away. Why? I think it's something future historians will really puzzle about, my says. But there's also a big difference between inspiring people, okay, which can be done very generally at a very high level of abstraction, and really creating constituencies for change. It's one thing to talk about 
time for a change. And it's one thing to sell the specific changes to constituencies and bring that to scale. I can talk about change in the most inspirational ways. But when it comes to actually getting the Naeem family to make a choice and a sacrifice for this specific change, that's much harder. Let me ask you about globalization. You were uh, one of the pioneers in, in writing and explaining and, and anticipating uh, a world that was more integrated, connected, hyper-connected, yes. interdependent. Those are all yes. words you have used. Do you have a feeling now that globalization is under threat? That there are lots of forces of nationalism, isolationism, uh, tribalism uh, that are uh, limiting uh, the expansion of uh, globalization. Sure. So there's one thing I think you really have to distinguish between, and that's the trend and the event. Okay. So what is the what is the trend? The underlying trend I think is that the world is going from flat to fast. That is, when I wrote The World is Flat, starting in 2004, the new, new thing then was, I'm being touched by people that never touched me before. And I'm touching people who I could never touch before. I think of my mom, my late mother, called her up one day in Minnesota. She was a little perturbed. I said, Mom, what's wrong? She said, you're interrupting me. I'm playing bridge on the internet with someone in Siberia. Okay, That's what was new about globalization in the early 2000s. The world was getting connected. And when that was happening, I tried to capture that by writing The World is Flat. I think what's going on now is now that all these tools are getting out there and they are becoming much greater at being able to abstract enormous amounts of complexity. Think about Uber, the online taxi app. So what was it like two years ago? Downstairs here, boy says, if I left your, last time I was on your show and I needed to get a cab. Taxi, taxi, taxi. Oh no, oh, now no, it's raining. Cell phone. I need a taxi. Yeah, I'm at 33, uh, 1333 8th Street. A half an hour, but I gotta be at the train station. At... Now, Uber. I can see the taxi coming up in my map. Okay. So we are. What's happened is because all these tools of flattening have now been distributed. We can now stack them up in ways that is allowing for enormous complexity to become free. Let me tell you that uh, just in recent days, there were two stories about Uber. Mm -hmm. One in France, mm -hmm. where the police right. went after mm -hmm. the Uber drivers and the company mm -hmm. tried to stop it. Right. There's another story coming from Mexico, where taxi drivers in Mexico are beating up Uber drivers. Mm -hmm. So we see the forces of traditional right. ways of thinking, like in France, plus the forces of violence and crime, like in Mexico, trying to stop what is what you describe as a positive thing. I think you like Uber. I, 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 I actually find and, it efficient. And then, but you see around the world, there are people that are disliking and, and Uber, and, and this is a very good example of new uh, technologies that are very disruptive, but are disrupting also the ways of life of people that don't know what to do if they are not taxi drivers. So use that example to explain the forces uh, against globalization that may be slowing it down right. or even reversing. Moises, if horses could have voted, there never would have been cars. If horses could have voted, there never been cars. And if taxi drivers can vote, they'll never be Uber. So we've seen this before, all right? And all I can tell you is when you develop a technology that meets the needs of so many people, that technology is going to come, all right? There's going to be resistance, but it is going to come. Now, I think the big challenge going forward is I care about those taxi drivers that are, are being uh, made obsolete in, in their profession. We need to take care of those people because, by the way, it's not just taxi drivers. The Associated Press Wire Service now uses computer algorithms to write local sports stories and write up business stock reports, okay? How soon before they algorithmize me? Okay, so, uh, you know, these changes are coming. The first rule of globalization is whatever can be done, will be done. The only question is will it be done by you or to you? So we are going from an age when computers were things you programmed to do a certain task, 
to computers being something that you, you program to do a task and they learn along with you, to computers becoming your partner in performing that task. That's where the technology is going to take us. So we have to be thinking about how do we create a job market that will enable more people to be partners with computers. Uh, in conclusion, uh, should people that are listening, should they be worried or should be, they be hopeful? It all comes down to me, Moises, to one thing, governance. We've been through transitions before as mankind, as Americans, as Latin Americans. We've been through transitions before. And what will differentiate when there's a folk singer, she's a folk country singer who I really like. Her name is Brandy um, Carlisle. And she has a song that has become my theme song. It's called The Eye. And the main refrain from her song is, you can dance in a hurricane as long as you're standing in the eye. And the job of government today is to help each of us individually and collectively to build an eye that will be resilient in the face of all these changes. And remember, the eye of a hurricane moves, so it's not static, all right? Because more and more, collectively and individually, we're being asked to dance in a hurricane, and you can only do that if you're standing in an eye. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye.